Good evening, it is now 6.30 and I will call to order the April 27th, uh, uh, 2015 Burnsville Planning Commission. Welcome, commissioners. Welcome, thank sure. you for joining this evening. Staff, thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, the first item on our agenda this evening is the adoption of the uh, published agenda. And uh, commissioners, do you uh, have any changes? No changes. Staff? No changes none from staff. Hearing none, I will stand for a motion. So moved. Moved by Commissioner Benke. Second. Second by Commissioner Thomas. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Um, second item on our agenda this evening is the approval of the published minutes from the April 13th, 2015 Planning Commission. Uh, commissioners, do you have any changes to the minutes? No, no None for me. None staff? For staff. Done? I will stand for a motion. So moved. Moved by Commissioner Corey. Second. Second by Commissioner Thomas. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay, and the motion carries. Third item this evening, we this is a public hearing. It's an application for Chris and Terry Burdick for a one-lot subdivision to be known as Burdick First Edition and variances to the uh, front yard setback, the lakeshore setback, uh, and the driveway width for a new home located at 735 Crystal Lake Road East. Presenting this evening is Mr. Slania. Thank you, Mr. Slania. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Uh, as in indicated, this is a public hearing. There are a number of approvals required with this project. I'll walk through those as we go. Uh, we are dealing with a single family home, proposed new single family home. It is a single family lot, one parcel. Uh, it is located on uh, Crystal Lake. The uh, subject site and surrounding properties are all zoned uh, single-family residential, low-density residential in the comprehensive plan. Uh, the existing home was constructed in 1930. It is a single-story walkout. The property owners purchased this uh, uh, in November of 2014. Uh, prior to and since purchasing the site, uh, they have been in touch with staff looking at designs and layouts for the site uh, that are going to be conducive to everyone involved and uh, I'm happy to bring the presentation forward to you this evening. Uh, the property has never been platted uh, so part of the steps with the new home construction would be platting it for a legal description with lot and block, getting the proper easements in, in place um, as there are none currently uh, that is the first uh, step. The lot size and uh, easement requirements are in place. Staff has no concerns with those. There are three deviations being discussed with the application, and I'll walk through those. Uh, as with deviations, we discuss uh, the intent of the ordinance and the practical difficulties involved with the uh, variance. And the practical difficulty uh, simply means is the able, excuse me, is the property able, owner able to put the uh, site into reasonable use uh, under the current restrictions? And that is, uh, that is a standard uh, test established by the state of Minnesota. Basically, is the applicant looking for uh, a reasonable size home uh, on a reasonable size lot, what are uh, the deviations being requested and, and is that the fault of the property owner, is it the fault of the design of the home, or is it a fault of, uh, in this situation, the shoreland restrictions and so forth. The first I'd like to touch on would be the front yard setback. Well, let me just touch on this aerial photo for a second. You see here the existing home. You see here outlined in teal the existing home and just a broader span of how large these lots are, uh, how deep they are specifically, uh, some of the other existing setbacks on this uh, section of Crystal Lake Road. The uh, first request is for a front yard setback. This is the footprint of the proposed home and we're looking at a 15.7 foot setback to the property line. 
Uh, the existing home is at 15.2 feet. Uh, you'll also notice that there's a substantially larger right-of-way along Crystal Lake Road than normal um, or than typical. Oftentimes, the space between the back of the curb and that uh, front property line is 8, 10, 12 feet. Uh, in this, in this uh, situation, it's closer to 20 feet. So there is a much larger right-of-way and essentially pushes that uh, front property line much closer to the home uh, than in other areas. Uh, again, staff finds this consistent with the neighborhood. Uh, the adjacent property is right at 15.3, uh, uh, 14 and change on the other side of the um, on the other side of the site. The second deviation deals with the required setback from the ordinary high water mark or the edge of the lake in this case. The existing home is at 44 and a half feet. Proposed, the applicant is at 42 feet. Again, uh, neighboring properties are at 39 and 33 uh, on either side. And here we get into a somewhat of a, a push and pull situation. The applicant can increase the front yard setback, but that decreases the rear yard setback. The applicant can get uh, further from the lake by shifting the home uh, north or to the street, but then that decreases the front yard setback. So in looking at this, the applicant uh, did a very good job of trying to can stay consistent with what's out there. Uh, it is two feet closer than the existing. Uh, staff had a long discussion with the applicant with that. It could be adjusted. It does provide for more grading, more tree loss, uh, and really limited benefit uh, by adding another two and a half feet. Uh, and the third variance requested is a requirement at the property line that uh, driveways be no wider than 24 feet. And again, I want to specify again, this is at the property line, not at the curb. Uh, at the curb, the applicant is well within the, the requirement. He's at uh, 20 feet, 20 and a half feet. It's just a situation where the uh, lot is not that deep and the applicant is proposing a three-stall garage. They're at 37 feet with a, the opportunity to sharply narrow down the driveway, uh, getting to the street, getting to the curb cut. The point of that is so uh, to limit the amount of hard surface in a front yard, uh, both from environmental standpoint and aesthetic standpoint. Uh, it also helps control traffic uh, specifically in a commercial or a retail s uh, setting. You don't want large uh, curb cuts everywhere along a busy road. In this situation, it is uh, difficult to configure this and still get 24 feet at that front right, uh, excuse me, at that front property line. Again, the front property line's 15 feet in front of the house. Uh, staff does find these variances or the request reasonable. Uh, the required setback from the ordinary high water line of Crystal Lake is 75 feet back. The required front yard setback is 30 feet. That puts you at 110 feet, excuse me, 105 feet worth of setbacks. And at its longest or deepest point, the lot is 113 feet deep. Uh, the applicant has done uh, a nice job with the required buffer. Uh, this is a vegetative buffer strip the applicant is required to install as part of construction. Native plants, this area is uh, not maintained, not mowed, not chemically treated, and provides uh, for an area to capture water runoff from the existing, or excuse me, the proposed structure. Uh, the applicant has satisfied this requirement. Uh, there is a condition in your packet. The applicant uh, has been focused on the design and location of the home. They have not discussed uh, where the dock would be or how they would access this. Um, they are entitled a, an access point uh, and 
staff would like to get a handle on that during construction. We've added a condition that that uh, point be provided uh, by August 1st. That will allow the applicant to get uh, substantial construction underway, but prior to final planting of the buffer strip and any landscaping, we'll have that pinned down. Uh, Oftentimes, uh, plat is associated with development fees and a uh, development contract with the city. Uh, as there is an existing single family home being replaced by a new single family home, this is not an intensification of the site. No park or development fees are required. Uh, staff is not requiring a development contract because there are no public improvements. It is on uh, all uh, private property and there are no fees required. I did touch on the landscaping. I also have some images. Again, this is the uh, front of the home, what you would see from the street. This is what you would see from uh, the lakeside. The applicant is proposing uh, quality building materials. Uh, no maintenance, we're looking at uh, LP siding and shakes. There is a stone veneer on the base, or <clears throat> excuse me, stone or stone veneer on the base. It is a walkout. Uh, the applicant is within the height limitations for uh, the zoning district and adjacent to the lake. Um, as I indicated before, the site is single family, residential. Uh, single family home exists to be replaced with a, uh, a new home. The applicant has, has taken all of staff comments under advisement and uh, has uh, prepared the plaque correctly. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you have any questions, I will stand for questions, but staff is recommending approval. There was only one condition in the staff report, uh, and the property owner is here should you have questions. Thank you, Mr. Slaney. Commissioners, questions? Okay. Just a couple, I think. Okay. Um, Christopher, since we're at the lake, is there any are there any runoff issues that we deal with? Is they, are they intending to put gutters on and, and direct to the street or anything along those lines? Um, uh, commissioners, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, that was not a conversation I had, but if they are, whether it goes to the street or to the lake. Um, essentially, that's what the vegetative strip is for along the lake. Okay. And also, I noticed in the um, the review um, guidelines for practical difficulties, it said proposed use allow for saving of trees uh, or other natural resources, and it's listed as no. Now, there are a large number of trees on the lot. Are they all coming down? They are not coming down. Uh, commissioners, that was a difficult question. Um, there are more trees coming down if, than if the existing home were left alone. I see. Uh, but uh, the applicant has done a very nice job. I believe only five trees are being removed. Uh, three of those are ash. Uh, and again, the home could be shifted, but that um, really affects. There is a cluster of home, uh, excuse me, cluster of trees right in the front yard the applicant's trying to preserve as well as, as this end. Um, to meet the setback, the home would likely get shifted uh, to the left, as you see it on the site plan, which would affect these trees. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a public hearing, or this application does require a public hearing, so at this point I'd like to open the public hearing and ask anyone in the audience to come up and speak to this issue. Please... Uh, Please give us your uh, your name and your address for the record, please. Good evening, Chairman. Good evening, Board. Dean Stuckey, 725 Crystal Lake Road East. I live next door. Be the property to the west. Um, in reviewing his plans, they are uh, terrific. You couldn't have a, a, a nicer home next door. So uh, that being said, I would only have one uh, issue that could possibly arise later. Um, when <clears throat> we purchased the home next door, 
the original owner of that home that had been in there since 1959 had shown us stakes, uh, the markers. When, not Mr. Burdick, when the uh, owner previous to him, his name is Mark Sear or Seen, or I don't recall his last name, but um, when he moved in, the so he did a survey, and we saw new markers put in place. We have approximately 102 feet, and there's a maybe a three-foot easement on the property to the east of us. If I take from one stake and pull 102 feet, I'm approximately 8 to 10 feet into my neighbor's home. So <clears throat> that being the only issue, we felt after the survey by Mark, whatever his last name was, a previous owner, we lost about four feet of property from what we assumed was. So that would be the only issue. Uh, other than that, uh, believe me, I have nothing nothing bad to say. I'm thrilled to see a beautiful home go in next door. I just wanted to make it known that there was an issue. Um, I didn't go and get another survey, didn't find it to be a issue at that point where, you know what, wherever the stakes are, that's where they are. You mow your lines to make it look whatever. It's not changing anything. But it does push, if you pull 102 feet, it does put us with the property line now running through our neighbor's yard. So I only wanted to come address it and mark it for the record that that, was, uh, that is a, a possible issue later on. The house goes in, it goes in, they all look the same. As long as, uh, as, long as it's correct, it is what it is. But you know, I see on this document here 200 feet and when I pulled from um, post to post or point to point, uh, not on the curb, from marker to marker, he was exactly at 200. And I'm not. I apologize. Sorry about that. Um, so anyways, there, and also when the new survey was done by the previous owner to Mr. Burdick, um, those were not in the position that we had believed them to be correct from the original owner that had been in there since 1959. Okay. So that was the only, the only thing I want to address and I do again want to make sure that Mr. Burdick understands he's got a first class home going in and we're thankful that that's what's going in. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Appreciate thank you very much for your comments. Anyone else uh, in the audience would like to speak to this issue? Anyone? Um, seeing no one, I will close the public hearing. And um, uh, would anyone like to speak to the homeowner? I was just wondering, Chris, on being when it gets platted and stuff would I'm not would the measurements be made and so would that all be straightened out yeah it, it's um, lot uh, lot markers can shift uh, which is a simple reason we do we do ask for a survey uh, with the plant there is more title work involved um, more digging than is typically involved with uh, with just a survey um, I will certainly follow up with the the neighboring property owner and we can discuss that my um, this really sets in stone where the lot lines are are moving forward with the plant with the plant um, so that may or may not be a benefit to the neighbor but it does um, I'm confident the information we have right now is accurate so basically it would, it would fix the issues and make them uh, Hopefully, solidify yeah. uh, the uh, the unknown would lines. be gone. Correct. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing there's at least three different surveyors involved here right now. You see the same thing, Paul? I'm seeing just Jacobson. We did the previous one. Well, there's one, one up here. There's one on the neighboring property to the east. There's two different ones on this property. Well, as far as pin numbers? Yeah. 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 Um, I guess, if I may. What? I think this is awesome too, mainly from the standpoint that this lot is easily subdivided in half and still meet the, meet the lot requirements, correct? 10,000 square feet? It would be except for the lakeshore requirements. Sure. sure, but I could see somebody asking for that. And to get one house on a mm -hmm. one house lot is, is definitely a benefit. And a very nice house too from that matter. Anything else? Well, regarding the platting, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, now's the time to figure that out. I mean, I'd suggest that you you guys cooperate and find a surveyor that surveys both parcels. I see a number of iron pins found. I'm not an expert in surveying, but um, if there is an issue, now's the time to take care of it. And I wouldn't, so. I wouldn't necessarily trust the homeowner that had been there since the '50s. <laughs> that they may have. They showed you the pins. Yeah, they. There's always misconceptions. The so. pins were there when we moved in, when the owner that purchased it from the original owner from 59, those pins were gone okay. on that area. So that's where my, that's really where I have an issue and the fact that we ended up losing what we thought was about four feet. And now when you pull the, you pull the 102 feet is 102 feet. And then tape measure with the first three feet cut off of it. If you pull it in and it's going through my neighbor's hop home, it's going right through maybe five feet of his home. So something is astray. And I would say that because that lot is twice as large as the lots next door, that if there is a small amend, it probably would behoove to come out of the 200 versus the 103 side where that number all of a sudden comes to the next house. And I apologize, I don't have the, if you, but if you, if you look at it, you, you would see that the lot line goes right through the bedroom of the house to the east of me, or to the west of me, excuse me. I would, uh echo uh, Commissioner Thomas's comment, uh, now would be the time to, and that's something, um, I appreciate what you're, what you're discussing, but that's not something we would, as a, as a commission, would act on, but I do think now would be the time with, with the platting and the, and the surveys to kind of maybe get together and get that cleaned up. Some of, you know, I think we run into this sometimes, especially, if, I thought that the note that the home had been built in the 30s was a mistake, uh, so I thought maybe, it might have been the 80s, but uh, so obviously, as long as the home's been there, there's probably some some uh, some discussion. Sure, Commissioner Benke. Are are the other lots um, here platted already too? Then no, none of them very, are. Uh, uh, the neighbor's lot is not. Very few of them along this stretch are. Okay. With no further discussion, I would stand for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the Planning Commission recommend to the City Council approval of the Burdick First Edition plat and the variances to the front setback, lakeshore setback, and driveway width for a new house located at 735 Crystal Lake Road East with the one condition as stated. I would second. Second. Would it be wise to include a discussion between the two homeowners about clarifying this? Or, I mean, we're essentially telling the commission that the city council that we're, we're good with the plat, but if there's a question here, we should probably address it. In looking at the plat, if, if the lot line does shift specifically on that side, it doesn't affect um, the applicant's uh, home. The, the setbacks are True. still satisfied. True. Lot size changes slightly. Uh, green space will change just slightly. Uh, but I think that is, I think that's something the two homeowners should work out privately. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have a motion on the floor, so um, 
I'll take a roll. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. And the motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, choosing Burnsville to uh, stay and, and build a new home. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is, I will read this long description. We are going to hold a public hearing, and it is an application uh, for the City of Burnsville for an ordinance amending Title 10, Chapters 6 and 8 to create a new drinking water protection overlay district and to amend the zoning map to identify the location of the district and amending Title 7, Health and Sanitation Establishing Standards of Practice for protection of the drinking water supply. And now people are leaving in drones after I said that. <laughs> and uh, presenting this evening is our public works director, Mr. Steve Albrecht. Thank you for coming this evening, sir. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Planning Commissioners. Uh, what we have tonight is I'm going to give a brief presentation on our drinking water protection, the proposed overlay district ordinance, and um, take you through how we got to proposing the ordinance. Then we do it. It is a public hearing tonight, so we'd ask you to open the public hearing, take any comment, answer any questions you have, and then make a decision on whether to recommend that this move forward to the City Council. Um, at that time, so um, just starting uh, from scratch, the City of Burnsville has been. Um, obviously providing public water since the 60s to since the city became a city and even before when it was not a city providing there was a public water system here and um, in the last two decades cities have been required to uh, put together what are called wellhead protection plans as part of of the city's operation of those systems. However, unfortunately, the wellhead protection plans really are just a document that allows the city to understand what they have. There's no legal requirements associated with them that in, compel cities to do any protection measures or anything of really um, any substance. The latest round of wellhead protection plans, which were passed um, a couple of years ago, City of Burnsville's was in June of 2013, required cities to um, initiate some action and actually proactively be protecting our wellhead and our water sources with the idea that reactionary protection is not a good thing. We see what's going on around 3M and some other areas of the cities where we have contamination. Once groundwater is contaminated, it's almost impossible to get the contamination out other than through costly treatment methods. So what we'll do tonight is we'll take you through um, the ordinance, um, talk a little bit about the purpose and intent of the overlay district, uh, water use, uh, drinking water supply sources, and why we need a drinking water protection overlay district. What is it? Because a lot of people wonder, what is it? How is it going to affect my property? Um, when does the ordinance apply? How is the city going to monitor and enforce this? It's one thing to pass an ordinance. We don't want to pass ordinances that we're not going to be moving forward on enforcing, so that's an important part of it. And then the schedule for the process. And then take any questions. But I would ask along the way, if you have a question or something jumps out at you, please stop me and, and ask the question. And again, to the, those in the audience, we will open a public hearing afterwards so they can come up and ask questions and, and make comments. So purpose and intent of the district. Um, basically, this district acknowledges that there are areas within the city of Burnsville that are highly susceptible to drinking water contamination. And it's based on a couple of things. Where our wells are located, surface water, our wells and our surface water supply are located, and what they call geomorphology or the geology. Burnsville, one of the wonderful things about Burnsville is we have this terrain that's hilly and such. The problem is as you get closer to the river, the natural protections of the groundwater aquifers are very thin because you're going down into the valley and the surface soils have been eroded over the years by the river, which makes us more susceptible where we have some of our wells in Burnsville, and we'll show you that in a second. Um, and then also to provide for land uses and regulation which is compatible with protection of the drinking water supply. Now Burnsville is a developed community, it's a little more challenging for us. Our entire wellhead protection area and surface water overlay district is been developed. It may redevelop, but it has been developed. And so where you have many cities where they can, before development occurs, you can restrict certain uses. We don't have that luxury. And so our ordinance is much more of a recognizing what we have, working with the existing businesses uh, to be responsible with any chemicals or things they have, and, and taking that tact on it. Because um, there's a large economic area in our overlay district, and it's not feasible for Burnsville to just say, we're not going to have anything ever in this district that can contaminate groundwater just isn't going to work. And so we have to take a little different approach, and we'll talk about that. City water use. I just want to, for the, for the public and for the commissions, uh, give, give you a little background on our water use and so people understand the, the vast amount of water. Um, Burnsville pumps, on average, over 3.2 billion gallons of water a year. 
Uh, that's a significant amount of water. The Kramer Quarry pumps another 3 billion gallons of water out of the, their shallow lake and into the river. So over 6 billion gallons of water a year are pumped in the city of Burnsville. Um, like I said, 1.1 billion. Um, Kramer takes 3 billion out to the river. We take um, about 1.1 billion of their water and we bring it into our system. So we actually have what we call a surface water and well-fed system. So we have 17 wells that provide groundwater and then we have a surface water intake, which actually takes water that's coming from the ground and then takes it right into our system. So it's not your traditional lake or river surface water source. But um, so we do have a very unique system. Um, the other part that we f often forget is we provide 80% of Savage's annual water. Um, through a water use agreement, Savage buys 80% of their water from the city of Burnsville. So it's not just our residents and our businesses that use our water, it is Savage's too. And on a peak day, it's not uncommon for the city of Burnsville to pump more than 20 million gallons on a peak day to meet those needs of the community. When we look at our supplies, um, this is, uh, we've got Highway 13, 35, we've of course got the Kramer Quarry, at the south end of the Kramer Quarry, we have a reservoir that is constructed where the city intakes our water um, that comes out of the ground at that location into our system. Again, we take about 1.1 billion gallons. And then you'll see the various numbers here. We have um, a nesting of wells if you're just basically just south of the Walmart and to the east of the Walmart up cliff, we've got a series of wells in that location, um, 11 of them in fact. And then if you get up to Burnsville Parkway, we've got another series of five wells extending out to the east. That is the supply for the city of Burnsville's water supply. So again, a mix of surface water source and um, groundwater. So the question is, why do we need a water supply overlay district? Um, and the big thing is, is as I want to jump back to, is if you looked at where our wells are, a lot of those are down at the toe of the bluff in an area where there aren't the natural protections, and I'll show you that in a second. And so. We do need to take precautions uh, to make sure that we don't have any man-made issues that cause uh, problems for our wellhead. And um, the overlay district will give us the framework for making sure that any substances that could be harmful are contained properly. They're inside, or if they are outside, they've got secondary containments or containments that are required by law in most cases are, and are functioning properly. And we'll do this through um, some biannual inspections that will be undertaken by the Public Works Department. Um, through a con probably through a consultant or contractor that we will use to do that. Um, there will be a cost, you note in, your, um, in the report, it's about $20,000 a year for the city. But when you look at what we're protecting of over 3 billion gallons of water a year used, it is a pretty small uh, piece of the water system operation, which is in excess of $18 million a year in water sales and sewage use. So it's a significant enterprise, $20,000 to protect that is not, is not a large amount when you look at it in that scope. So if we just give you a cross section I was talking about, this area here, if you think of this as the Minnesota River, um, and as you go up the bluff here, if we look at this dark blue line, that's kind of the slope as we get up the bluff. Now this red line represents the top of our aquifers. And as you see up at the top of the bluff in the Burnsville Parkway area, we have, this is meters actually, so we have in excess of 200 feet of soils on top of the aquifer. Oftentimes clay soils, tighter soils that if there is a contaminant, Number one, the contaminant isn't going to get down to the aquifer right away. And number two, it may or may not get down to the aquifer depending on the soils and how it, it hangs up in the soils. So there is some natural protection there. As you go down towards the river, our aquifer has less than 10 feet of actual soil cover over the top of the, the bedrock as we get towards the river. That's why down in the river bottom, the Minnesota River quadrant along cliff, that's why we're concerned about what potentially could happen there. And as we start talking about the district, some of the areas that are in the district are just drainage areas to that. They're not actually areas at the bottom of the bluff, but they're areas that if something spills, it's going down the hill into a storm sewer or a pond that is in that area. And so that's why those areas are contained too. So if you look at this yellow area, it tries to demonstrate to you up at the top of the bluff, not as big an issue, pretty standard situation compared to most cities. Bottom of the bluff, very thin, not a lot of protection areas. So we do need to do some additional things. Mother Nature isn't going to protect our water supply for us in those areas. Now this map is a little busy, so I'll try to take you through this. Uh, I apologize for that. So what we've got is we've got this red circle here. This represents, as I had told you, our quarry has an area where it draws um, groundwater from and that the Kramer quarry, what Kramer pumps, also drowns ground, draws groundwater from and pumps out. Burnsville's quarry um, intake is, is a portion of this area and long term when Kramer turns off their system, 
this will be the area ultimately that could contribute groundwater. And so that's why that's an area that we want to regulate and protect and make sure if we have issues, we've identified those issues. Um, now, looking at this red area, this is an area where those, those thicknesses of natural protections are very minimal. Um, the good news for us, for the most part, and I'll show you in a second here, um, this black line represents kind of the area that influences our wells. Um, a majority of the red area doesn't influence our wells. It's right to the Minnesota River. It's up in the Black Dog Power Plant. None of that actually influences um, our well area. But this area inside the black does. Um, and so the areas we're particularly concerned with are obviously the red area where we have minimal thickness of natural protections. This darker yellow area are the areas where we get a lot of drainage and we have wells actually clustered in that zone. And so that's why that area is of specific concern. Lighter yellow and green, we don't have wells in those areas. In many cases, we've got a lot of residential uses, um, and we've got a lot of thickness of soil. So we're not as concerned about that. So when we talk about, in a second, I'm going to show you the map of the district, how we came up with that map. We looked at this blue area and said, okay, what are the issues that the city of Burnsville is going to have to deal with? Because this is a large district. It could be complicated. And we decided that the areas that aren't going to be a problem for the city long term are not areas that we should be concerned about. Let's focus on the critical areas at the bottom. And so when we jump to this next slide, you'll see that what we're concentrating on here is really our Highway 13 corridor and north in that area. Um, these are the areas where a spill occurs or something occurs. We don't have a lot of time. We're talking less than a year in some cases before it's going to get down to the aquifer if we don't capture it properly. And so these are the areas that we want to make sure we're working with our businesses and property owners to maintain uh, the proper protections. And so that's the area that's proposed as the district. And so that's how the district evolved to this shape. If you wonder where we came up with this, we looked at what are the critical properties that are either developed or will redevelop in this area that we want to identify and work with those property owners on. So what we've proposed is a two-part ordinance. The first part is provisions for new development, building expansions, or land disturbance activities in the overlay district. Now, we already have provisions in our ordinance for those. All we did was tweak the existing provisions and add a couple other things that are particular to um, the groundwater issues. And then the second part is, what do we do with existing businesses that aren't going to redevelop or we're not going to see new development in those areas? How do we deal with those? And so we'll talk through both of those parts because that's what's concerning to the property owners, those who may redevelop their property someday and those who operate an existing business. That's what they're going to be interested in. So looking at part one, um, development land disturbance activities. Basically, when we have a site come in for redevelopment or for a permit or a conditional use permit, we have a series of things that they're required to do. We will be adding to those things, um, number one, wash pads. So we have, if you're familiar with the MRQ, we have a lot of vehicle areas where they do a lot of washing down of heavy equipment and such. We're going to work with those property owners as they redevelop or add on. Let's add wash pads and containment for the stormwater or the runoff that you're getting from washing vehicles down to make sure we don't have any issues if something spills or is being washed into the, because that area is very sandy where we don't have the peat soils. Um, then the other one is this last one. Most of the businesses in this district that have what we call regulated substances, which are the substances that we're concerned about, um, they're substances that have different chlorine-based products in them. Um, I won't get in. There's a big list that we have in the ordinance. But those are the substances that, um, with solvents that pose risk to our, to our groundwater. Most of the businesses are already have permits for those. And so in our case, we're not looking to duplicate the state's process or any federal process. If you have permits, just provide us with a copy of the permit so we know that. And so that's part of the process is if you need a permit, we just want to make sure that they have a permit. Uh, part two of the business provisions, as I talked about, this is where we get into existing businesses, and we're going to talk about regulated substances. Um, and number one, are they properly secured and stored? And what, what I want to, um, as I've talked to businesses over the last two weeks, one of the important things to understand is we're only concerned about regulated substances that pose a risk to groundwater, and there's a whole bunch of other qualifications that aren't commercially packaged for sale. So things that you're buying at Menards that are already packaged and contained, we're not concerned about that. We're concerned about things that are, for example, chemicals that are stored in amounts of 55 gallons or more that could that meet the that have actual warnings for groundwater on them. Those are the types of chemicals or dry chem, dry products that have that type of warning on them too. So it's not every chemical, and so that's part of it too. And I think a lot of the businesses determined that this isn't going to impact us at all. 
um, just because we don't even have any of those types of chemicals that were, or they're exempt. A, a vehicle or piece of equipment with gasoline and oil in it is not restricted by this ordinance because the oil and gasoline and chemicals that are used for the vehicle operation are not prohibited. Now, if they had large tankers on them and things like that and they were stored, that's a different issue and we want to work through that with them. Um, commercial application of regulated substances shall meet the requirements in this code. We already have code um, in our, we already have portions in our ordinance that deal with commercial application. This, that isn't new. It's just ensuring that these businesses in this district, district are following that. Um, provisions for secondary containment. All we're asking for there is if you do have large quantities of chemicals and they're stored outside, because if you're storing them inside, again, unless it's going to spill and go out of your building, we're not concerned about it because it's contained, you've got a containment system. But if you're storing them outside, we want to make sure they have secondary containment. And I would tell you the majority, the vast majority of the companies we've talked to that have these types of chemicals already have that in place. It's regulated by the state. So again, for them, not a big change. They've been dealing with those regulations for a long time. Um, and then you've got an emergency spill response plan required. And again, those who are already regulated have all of this in place. Um, and then evidence that your required permits are in place for regulated substances. It's really an act of the city doing bookkeeping to make sure that the businesses that are in the, in the district that are using those chemicals are following the rules. And the city is going to bear the brunt of the cost to do that. That's one thing we've stressed with the businesses. We're not looking to put, impose um, permits and annual applications and things on the businesses. We're going to be going out um, every other year a business will be contacted. After that first year of scoping with them, if there's no changes, it'll be as simple as a phone call and a verification that nothing's changed and we'll talk to you again in two years. And, but if it's something where we have to work through it with them, we'll sit down and, and the city is going to pay our consultant to work with them so that they don't have to incur costs of having someone um, fill out the paperwork and do that. So that's one thing. We, we will ask them to give some time to help us get that initial paperwork filled out, but we want to be sensitive to that because that can be a burden for them just from a time standpoint and understanding the regulations. Um, again, those are new requirements. And so the question is how are we going to, and I touched on it a little bit, how are we going to enforce this? Well, annually, which we do now, um, to some level, we will be providing information to the property owners about this section and what's required in that area, just informationally. Um, and then biannually, we're going to be doing an inspection. So we'll be doing half the district every year, essentially, um, and we'll break that up. And as I said, the first year working through, we already, the city did an inventory and inspection when we did our wellhead plan several years ago. We'll be taking that and we'll be working with all the property owners in the district. And as I said, um, I would guess that 99% of them, will, we will go through a quick checklist within maybe 10 minutes, a visual inspection of their site with them, and we'll be gone. And that'll be it for two years. There will be maybe 1%. And the, the area, some ask, well, why do we need this ordinance as the state regulates? Um, there are a bunch of agricultural exemptions in the state of Minnesota that allow certain amounts of chemicals up to certain sizes to be kept without state permits or MPCA permits. And so um, it's just not required. We're trying to make sure that everybody who has the types of chemicals that could, ha that could harm the groundwater, if they don't have to have a permit from the state, they at least have a plan in place for containment and spill, and, they, and they're aware that that chemical could contaminate the groundwater and could be an issue. So that's really the purpose of our ordinance. And then those who already have the regulated chemicals and who are operating, we know where they are. We can work with them. Um, and in many cases, we can get grants from the Department of Health if they want to upgrade containment or do things of that nature, too. So that, that's really the, the idea of the inspections and working with them. And then third, um, for those who are in critical locations or have a lot of regulated substances, those are the ones we're going to stay in touch with the most and make sure they have all the latest information um, and that we're both comfortable that there's no issue. Uh, I have yet to talk to any of our businesses who want to contaminate the groundwater. And so they're, I think they're all taking a positive approach. Most of them, as I said, we've talked through, I have yet to encounter one that isn't already exceeding anything our ordinance is going to require on their property. So um, that's the, kind of the approach we're going to take with this. Um, Schedule-wise, uh, we were at the Parks and Natural Resource Commission or Committee a couple weeks ago uh, with a presentation. Uh, we had a public informational meeting on the 16th. We mailed out about 1,000 notices to that informational meeting. Uh, we had about six or seven um, owners, property owners, or different in, in um, industrial uses come and talk through some issues with them, make sure they understood it. Um, I think we have one of those that's back here tonight. Um, who I've talked to on the phone, I believe, too. So I think, and, and we've talked it through, I don't think we have any issues with this property. I think he's interested in how we're going to operate the district and making sure it's not a burden on, on their business. Um, 
And then we'll, we're at the Planning Commission, obviously, tonight. Uh, we'll be at the Economic Development Committee on the 13th, and then the Council as early as June 2nd. Uh, we don't want to rush forward with this. We know that it's kind of a, a moving, um, it's something that's new. I, uh, we're the first city in the metropolitan area to take this step forward um, on their groundwater protection. Be a lot of cities following us. Uh, for us, it's a big deal because our groundwater is susceptible. Um, not every city where I came from in Prior Lake, they have different soils out there. It's not an issue. The, the aquifers are several hundred feet deep. Still can get contaminated, but it's not as critical as it is in Burnsville where we have very little cover and we have a surface water intake too, which takes water from the surface. So it's, it's much more critical for us. So with that, I would take any questions um, and then I would ask that the commission open the public hearing, take any comments from uh, our businesses or residents and I can answer any questions on those and then consider uh, an action related to the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, commissioners, we'll start with questions. Commissioner Corey. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Albrecht, can you just sort of not step by step, but just walk me through sort of with a business the first go around? What, how much paperwork are we talking about? Um, how many meetings, that sort of thing, just to get a general overview idea of what type of commitment are we talking about here? Sure, and so the first, the first um, time we go there will be, actually it'll be a phone call, and it'll be a one-page checklist that the city's consultant completes, and it'll be a, a question and answer with the business. Uh, we already have an inventory existing from several years ago at, that lists, so we can use that as kind of a secondary check. We'll, so we'll have a, probably a 10-minute conversation on the phone, go through, look at what the business is, um, and then our consultant will probably do a drive-by out to the property just to confirm, yep, and that'll be it. That will be the first interaction. Now, if there are things that need to be looked at further, then they'll probably follow up on site in person with a visit from that point. So we would say that it, for 98% of the businesses, there's going to be very little. They may not actually ever meet us through that process unless we need to gain access to see something. But we're planning on it being th that not invasive at all. So. If I may. I get the idea that most of this would be for like outdoor storage areas of particular concern. Like, like you said, if they're indoors. Well, if they're indoors, it's a different issue. It goes into the sanitary sewer potentially. A um, different issue, but not an issue for our groundwater. Right. So not an issue for this ordinance necessarily. Right, that's what I mean. Yep. So basically you'd be looking at outdoor We're storage. Yes, things are going to be, for the most part, in plain sight. Yeah. Um, and we've, like I said, we did an inventory of that type several years ago, so we'll use that to cross-reference. And then by the nature of the businesses, too. You know um, dry cleaning businesses have certain kinds of chemicals, but if everything's contained indoors, not going to be an issue for us as to, as to this ordinance. So. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners? Just one Commissioner, thank you. Um, Mr. Albrecht, you, you talked about how when projects are developed or, or redeveloped, obviously there's a method to incorporate new, new ways of, of containing. Yep. But when something doesn't change, we really don't have a method of trying to improve what could be a less yes so if 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 they're not redeveloping or there's no permit required and we identify something on their property that's a regulated substance that doesn't meet what we would deem the minimum containment standards we're going to try to work i think partnership wise with the property owner to come up with how can we do that and the city has access to grant dollars from the department of health that are specifically for wellhead protection that can be used to offset costs of abandoning wells, um, putting in secondary containment, those types of things. So that's gonna be our first line of approach. And we're hopeful that through that process, to date, we've always been able to have businesses work with us through that type of process and more of a partnership with solving the problem. Um, and in most cases, like I said, there's just this narrow window of things that are legal that aren't regulated, which are the ones we're really looking for, so. Sure. So the need for some kind of a yeah. code enforcement section, okay. we're just gonna set that Oh. Well, and actually, that's what's it's actually it's laid out in the ordinance, and it's laid out under it's a little bit different situation, and then it's the responsibility of the public works director because I'm in charge of the water supply, so it's my job to follow through on the enforcement on that. So it would follow if someone was not agreeable and didn't work with us, we would follow. Then we would go to our standard enforcement process okay. beyond that. Um, but we're hopeful that, like I said, I have yet to have a conversation with anyone who wants to contaminate the groundwaters. But 
containment can be expensive, and there are things, you know, we don't know yet what we don't know. So we may have to adjust those strategies, and I think that's what we're trying to make clear to our business partners and property owners are we don't know all the circumstances we might find. We're committed to working together because it only benefits Burnsville as a whole if we work together to solve a problem. We don't want any, ending up in court doesn't solve any groundwater problems for us. Agreed. Thank you, Chair. Anything else? I got just a couple more questions. I, I think we're all in agreement that this is the last thing we want to have happen. And I think there's been some pretty ugly news in the past of communities not near us who have probably wished they would have done some of some of these things. But I want just real quick to in uh, to kind of put stuff in perspective for me from a redevelopment standpoint. So let's let's pick something we've done recently. Let's um, the approval of um, RDOs redevelopment or maybe the yes, NUS. Yes, yes. So that would be a redevelopment. So you know um, we uh, we allowed gravel for them because of the equipment. And so you talked in here about paving required, floor drains, wash pads. How does an exterior wash pad work? I get interior, it goes through a flame trap, I understand that. Honestly, an exterior one could be just a parking lot that captures the wash runoff into some kind of trap so that you can make sure there's no chemicals in it before it's discharged. And so it has some kind of a trap system. But oftentimes it's just a parking lot with its own specific catchment point so that they can make sure that there's nothing in it and it can be inspected. Okay. So not real complicated. It sounds actually more complicated than it is. So um, as you said, we have allowed um, storage of equipment on unpaved areas, and that's going to continue to be something that we deal with in the Minnesota River Quadrant. Um, the good news, I think, with NUS, because I don't know that RDO, did RDO have gra I don't, yeah. I, I had gravel in the back. Do they? Okay. So the majority of the equipment that's being stored is new equipment. Um, at least on the NUS site. Now there are stuff that they're working on, and so that's stuff we're going to have to work with. Um, obviously, we couldn't hold them to a standard that we hadn't yet established, and so it's something we're just going to have to work through. We've had equipment being stored outside in the Minnesota River Quadrant for 50 years, and so it's something that we don't want to have an accident and an issue, but I think um, we think that both of, both of those businesses are good partners and have worked with the city on their site, so we don't see that there's going to be issues for them. Um, these won't affect them because they've already redeveloped, but what we'll ask them to do when we go through is if there is something when we go through the inventory, let's say there's old equipment or equipment that leaks, we'll ask them to put some kind of containment in that gravel parking lot or put that equipment stored only on hard surfaces so anything can be contained. We'll try to work with them something that makes sense from a common sense standpoint. So. Okay, I wasn't yeah. singling oh, but, them out, but no, there was but just two Those are great examples, examples of we have, and we do, and it's been through. a push-pull for the council, I think, on outdoor storage and what you do in that river mm -hmm. quadrant. Um, theoretically, some of those uses are interim, but interim uses in this area could be 20 to 30 years, so that's not necessarily interim. So, And, and all of the stormwater ponds that you deno in our background noted about, they need to be lined, and what's the difference? Because typically the stormwater ponds, aren't lined because we want that water to dissipate. It depends on where you are. And the newest strategies in stormwater are to try to infiltrate as much water as you can so you're not sending more water downstream to receiving waters. Um, in areas where you have sensitive groundwater, which we have in our wellhead protection, our wellhead protection district, we haven't allowed infiltration ponds for several years. We typically don't allow those. And when we line it, we, they typically just add clay to the bottom of the pond. And then it won't. They pack the clay, and it doesn't. They don't typically put a manufactured liner in. They'll was, use clay on site. So. That was going to be like, what yeah. did we do with the stormwater pond at Yellow Freight that the city built for the MRQ? The, ours is lined, so ours passes that water all through and takes it around. So okay, yeah, okay. Those are all of my questions. I okay, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. I, I was just going to mention also that we did have discussions with both uh, NUS and RDO. Mm -hmm when we understood that they were going to be gravel storage areas, they are. Um, I'm not sure to what extent or what detail they do have state licenses through the uh, MPCA uh, for any uh, bulk tanks that they have on site. Um, they did not uh, express any concerns when we walked through this with them. Um, and oftentimes, again, as, as we discuss the ponds that we see, we we have been going with no infiltration for quite a while. It's just not a topic that comes up here. Um, we, they show a um, uh, stormwater pond on the site plan. It's already been discussed with our engineering department how it's constructed and so forth. Okay. So, 
Uh, well, this does require a public hearing, so at this point I would like to open the public hearing and invite anyone from the audience to come up and give us your thoughts. Would that include questions? Yes, please step up. Thank you. Please uh, give us your give us your your name and your address for the record, sir. Uh, Mr. James Much, M U T C H, Lakeville, Minnesota, representing Life Touch, Inc., Eden Prairie, Minnesota, also representing our photography support center in Burnsville. My question is a simple one. In your proposal, I do not see any provisions talking about rice reciprocating internal combustionable engines, which is used for generators. Generators to generate in the event of an emergency, sitting outside to power data centers. We're all on computers. Therefore, EPA stipulated back in the 70s that all generators would be double wall construction, holding the fuel to, to run those generators. Are you going to require a third containment system to take care of an up. event? Also, uh, also okay. within those systems, you do have a you do have a monitoring mm -hmm. system in the event you do have a leak mm -hmm. going into your secondary containment or your double wall. How are you going to address? I'll that? answer that very quickly. Our the we have provisions. We have an exemption in the ordinance for vehicles and equipment. At the build, at the building, or that are operational and maintain an operational condition for your operation. So Even a generator, a generator, no, any equipment sitting outside, yes, and as long as it's operational equipment. Now, if it was ten old generators sitting there rusting that weren't hooked up, that would not be exempt. But in the case of a generator that's an emergency standby, it's considered a piece of equipment of the business, and as long as it's operational, it is exempt from this ordinance and kept up to the codes that you've cited. So, very good. thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Anyone else that would please come up? Um, yeah, my name is John Buckland. I live in uh, on uh, 1092 Pioneer Drive. I work at the Alternative Technologies on River Ridge Boulevard. I guess I'm just curious uh, from a couple couple aspects. Um, as far as the, the volumes that you're looking at for uh, uh, contamination, if you've got a dripping truck, is that is that going to cause a problem, or are we looking at dozens or thousands of gallons of contaminants. Um, I guess I'm just, just trying to get a picture of the, the order of magnitude. Well, this, this ordinance isn't designed to necessarily go and look under every vehicle and see if it's dripping or not. I mean, that's not, that's not our intent, and we don't have the ability to do that. Um, we certainly, what we have found, um, even with car lots, the world has changed significantly as vehicle fleets are newer and, and such. We haven't had the issues of leaking and dripping equipment. But if there's equipment that's not kept operational, again, that's the key term is if we have non-operational equipment that's not being utilized and that we're licking and dr or, or, um, dripping and leaking in large amounts, that would be something that the inspection could catch. And it yeah. would say work with the business to say, look, we need to put that someplace where it's not going to cause an issue. So, so yeah, but I guess uh, in this area, then, that, that is a uh, threat to the groundwater? It, it could be. I mean, it, it depending on if it's in areas with thicker soils, we're not typically as worried about it. But when you're down in the Minnesota River quadrant with 10 to 20 feet of soil on top, that's something we want to work with those property owners to try to put that equipment on paved or, per, or impervious surfaces so it's not going directly into the ground. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm picturing, you know, like the 3M thing where they're, they're putting... Yep industrial quantities of, of, of materials, and I don't see that. No, we're, we're certainly not. That's not the, the goal. of. I, if that's the worst issue we have to deal with in the ordinance, then we'll be doing pretty good in this district. But um, we certainly, if there was a noticeable leak or something that was a problem, we would deal with it. But we're certainly not going looking, you know, at every piece of equipment to see if there's a small oil leak. That's not what okay. the focus of the ordinance is. Yeah, so, yeah. We don't, we don't yeah. handle any chemicals outside. Yeah. So, so then you shouldn't have any issues at all with the ordinance. Yeah, I don't, I don't see yeah. any issues on that. I guess my, my I'm, I'm curious because uh, I live, like, again, mm -hmm. I live in River Hills, yeah. and I'm curious about what, what threat we're, we're identifying and, and yeah. uh, uh, I yeah. guess I'm concerned about my, my drinking water. Yep, yep, and we're trying to be out in front of it and make sure we don't have any issues. So. Okay. So we are looking at larger quantities than what a single vehicle or, or the combined amount of, of vehicles together would deliver. So. Yeah. Are there businesses that handle um, those quantities? Well, as I said, there are many businesses that actually have fuel on site in less than I, and it's, I believe it's 699 gallons, but 
Um, the PCA does not require secondary containment or any permits for fuel at certain levels under the agricultural exemptions of the state. You don't have to be practicing agriculture to fall under that. They just don't regulate. And so there is a gap. Um, certainly 700 gallons of a chemical can cause an issue if it was gasoline or oil. Um, and so there are chemical amounts that are not regulated by the state that, that because of the way the state statutes are written with exemptions for farmers, Mm -hmm. that other businesses can use those too, and many businesses do use those on site. So, yeah, and that's, I guess, yeah. what, what I want to get a fuel for. So, so in, in that case, 700 gallons would be uh, of a fuel. Would for be example, that would be an area right. that we would want to focus on. So okay. um, as we say in here, we're looking at fuel amounts that are not prepackaged of more than 55 gallons. Yeah. So that's kind of our baseline. Yeah. So that's well, what we're focusing on, kind of 55 gallons up is what we're focusing yeah, on. Yeah, the guys I'm picturing yeah. are the... Uh, the fuel trucks mm -hmm. and the uh, yep. uh, and, exactly. and like the uh, whatever lawn service people that have yep. those trucks with the with the chemicals. Yep. Yeah, and so the those back. chemicals, if you're doing app chemical application, they're actually already regulated under our ordinance. Mm -hmm. And so, but again, with many parts of the ordinance having staff and resources to actually enforce some of those things, this will allow us to actually enforce things some of which already exist in our ordinance related to applications and stuff. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I, I guess uh, uh, I always picture those as being a greater. They are. You're threat. exactly right. Those are the things we want to work with those yeah. companies to make sure they have a spill plan and they know what's going on if they were to have an incident in our overlay district. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, please step up and give us your name and address for the record. Hi, my name is Tom Johnson, and I'm the owner of U.S. Salt, and uh, currently I'm right down in the. Uh, my address is 1020. Black Dog Road. We are right out uh, of the, the big coverall buildings as you cross the, the river there. Uh, we're a salt company, number one, and the question is on outside containment or containment as such. Most of all our product is in a building. Everything that we bring in, we sell to the city and the county and the state, and they dump every bit of that salt on your roads. So my question being is from a containment standpoint, and I'm looking at what kind of enforcement will there be on that. Secondly, I am totally surrounded by dump. And for right now, currently, I have MPCA monitoring wells and dump wells and everything else monitoring right now for what is coming my direction. And thirdly, everything that I have from a water standpoint flows to the river, except for all my groundwater, which flows to Kramer's Quarry. Uh, we used to have an artesian well that used to run 125 gallons a minute and once they started dewatering we lost all our water so currently it's a question of how does that impact us as such and then the last question and this is just something just from a a political thing a question <clears throat> i agree that we got to watch controlling any contamination of groundwaters but isn't that basically the same responsibility of everybody in the city of Burnsville. It's if you're picking a district out and saying, okay, this district, shouldn't people, even though they're so much higher from a regulation standpoint, you're saying they're so much higher that less impact, to be fair, that everybody should be regulated rather than just picking out a particular location. Unfortunately, I've been stuck where I'm at, and there's not a whole lot I can do about what we're, what we're doing. And currently, like I say, the city of Burnsville buys all their salt from us also, by the way. But the, the thing I'm looking at is we don't, we're not even near the ground, your groundwater basically going that direction. And I'm not sure, is salt a consider a contaminant? Well, chlorides are the next, what will be heavily regulated here in the near future for surface waters. Not necessarily for groundwater, but for surface water runoffs. Probably. Because when I applied for permits years ago, the MPC asked me or asked us to put in holding ponds, settling ponds, the collection. And we had just put them in, and 30 days later they came and they'd asked us to take them out because they didn't want the chance of anything polluting groundwater. They would just as soon have it go into the river. And, of course, all the salt and the, the stuff that we have all ends up in the river. So it's a question of how is that basically set up? And that's one of the questions I have from a salt operation here because currently, like I say, is we're collecting the salt, we're holding it, and you guys are distributing it. 
So my concern is, is how does that play out be from a legal standpoint? So that's, that's my concerns. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I can speak specifically, I think um, his properties are located right here on, right at the, right at the edge of the river here. And so um, as far as salt goes, um, number one, we would have to identify that there was actually a risk to the groundwater itself from the salt. Again, we're not right. This is not a surface water regulation. There may be, there are, well, there are issues with salt and surface waters. We would have to, number one, demonstrate that the salt as you have it stored is an issue to the groundwater. Um, number two in this area, we know two things going on. The water that's, the groundwater under your property actually goes to the Kramer intake and then back out to the Minnesota River. It does not actually come into play. We know a little bit more. We've done a lot of modeling down because of the landfills in that area. The city of Burnsville has done an extensive amount of groundwater modeling to make sure that we don't have any issues with those landfills and the properties. And so we know that their groundwater does not actually come to our system. So that'll be part of our strategy when we work with you. It'll be more, um, are, there th are there issues for the groundwater? Are there any uncapped wells or things like that that we need to protect? And so that's how it'll be approached with your property. Again, this ordinance isn't regulating surface water runoff to surface waters because that's not part of what this ordinance and it's also not under our jurisdiction from that standpoint as long as you're meeting the MPCA's requirements for storage we probably won't have any additional requirements on your property at all um, in your particular use as long as the salt is being maintained as is stipulated by the MPCA so and again I think what that raises is that our first time through we have a lot of different uses in this city. We have just about everything that you probably wouldn't plan out in your, in your groundwater protection area we have in Burnsville. And so we have to be um, proactive, but it's going to take kind of a customized approach with a lot of our businesses to, to look at what their use is, what their potential impacts are. And as I said, we've spent a lot of time and money modeling the groundwater in this area. We know what it's doing now and we have a pretty good idea when Kramer stops pumping in the future what it's going to do. So that'll allow us to work with businesses to really protect the groundwater um, and not sp spend their money or, or city money on things that aren't going to be protections. And then the last thing is we talked about why this area. I, I know it stinks, but the reality is this is the area where if stuff gets in the ground, it's going to get in our wells. Um, Burnsville Center, that water doesn't contribute to our, our, the groundwater in this area. Doesn't mean it couldn't contaminate the groundwater, but just where our pump intakes are located and our wells are located, we don't, um, we don't, uh, we wouldn't draw that water. And our legal authority is based on where our wellhead protection area is and where that's been established. And so we don't necessarily have the ability to extend out beyond areas that reasonably could impact our groundwater under certain conditions. And so that's why it isn't just a citywide um, ordinance at this point. Let me yep, that's that. fine. That's fine. Would there anyone else that would like to step up and speak to this matter? I just thought of one other thing. Are there any historical um, uses or threats for the, the groundwater? Uh, oh, there's all kinds of them in this area, and that's why we do all that groundwater mm -hmm. monitoring. There are um, landfills all along the Minnesota River. We have a power plant along the Minnesota River. So we, the city of Burnsville, the things that brought things people to Burnsville and spur in the development are not great things to have in an area where you're taking groundwater. So we are we have identified those and we're working with the PCA and the DNR and the Department of Health to make sure we don't have any issues in Burnsville. So. I guess I was thinking industrial uses farther away from the river, you know, uh, uh, that would be flowing towards the flowing towards the There are not any there are uses but not to the level of what we have down in the Minnesota River quadrant area or along cliff to answer your question. Okay. Well, um, at this point, I'll close the public hearing, and we'll uh, I'll move to Commissioner questions. Commissioner Benke. Yeah, Steve, I just heard you say something about the the salt that, you know, it it can get into the quarry pond, but then it goes right back out. But we're also drawing from the quarry pond. Um, well, his 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 runoff specifically. Yeah, we're uh, actually not drawing from the quarry pond. We're drawing from a city pond. At the south end of the quarry, right there's, and there's lobes. We've we've actually created a larger pond at the north end, and and they are pumping at a level that creates a curtain wall around the city's groundwater, which actually intercepts anything from any of the landfills, and then pumps it back towards the river, including any groundwater that would come from under Mr. It actually takes water. We know that the Kramer Quarry actually pulls water from the Minnesota River and recirculates it. It it has that much influence on it. So. 
we under normal circumstances we would be concerned but we and then we have the city does we have a barrage or a several monitoring points all around our system where we're taking quarterly samples of all the different additional chemicals that the Department of Health does not even monitor to make sure that we're not having any influence from any of the landfills in the area or any other industrial properties and we've been doing that for three and a half years and we have not had any even nominal amounts of contaminant and so what that shows is the way they designed it with the quarry pumping to protect things is actually working it intercepts stuff and sends it out to the river now to those who are worried about the Minnesota River that's not exactly a, the best solution necessarily but that's how it operates now I think I'd heard some of those things in your in the video that was put up online too and hadn't heard it here um, so what happens when they stop pumping we expect 25 to 30 years from now they will stop pumping there's two things that will happen the groundwater naturally flows towards the Minnesota River so the groundwater will continue that way so anything that's between our well intakes and the Minnesota River with the exception of slightly to the north will actually go to the Minnesota River so because of the geology and the way the groundwater flows that will protect us as far as the quarry lake itself we're in the process of modeling that right now we probably in 25 30 years won't take water from the lake like we do now we may because there'll be so much more there'll be three billion gallons of groundwater that was currently is being pumped away will all of a sudden be here there'll be more groundwater than we need in Burnsville at that point and so the city may have the option to turn our Jordan wells back on at 25 30 years from now and not use the quarry intake location and so we're looking at what the safest options are for Burnsville when that happens and that's a study that's ongoing right now so Very good. and currently our Jordans are turned off are we have turned off our Jordans closest to um, this is a fen uh, or was a fen it's not much of a fen anymore um, the city of Burnsville and the city of Savage as part of the, the grant that we got we got about seven eight million dollars from the state of Minnesota to help pay for the surface water project um, we agreed to turn two of our Jordan wells off that are closest to the fen and then Savage turned off some of theirs too and what we're seeing in Savage is the fen is actually rebounding there because they're not pumping from it and we know here once this three billion gallons of water stops getting pumped to the Minnesota River us taking a couple million gallons a day out of our wells again isn't going to have any impact on it at all and so that's why we're thinking that we may be able to go back to our pre-existing system at that point and use wells that are already there so but we're looking at those options because we certainly want to be environmentally friendly and provide the best protection for our groundwater to our residents and businesses so. okay very good thank you well right now it's depressed in the magnitude of 100 to 150 feet below so it'll it'll come back up and it'll fill the aquifer as I said it'll start flowing to the Minnesota River then again and so anything in the landfills that hasn't been closed off on the north in the one that's between US salt and the quarry could potentially go to the Minnesota River if they haven't closed the landfill by then. the good news there is the PCA and the EPA are working with the property owner and and we believe strongly that before the 25 years of the quarry stops pumping is up we will have a closure at that landfill and it will be lined and contained so there won't be an issue in the future so commissioners other other comments no. um, I would uh, stand for a motion in support or I, I would move that Planning Commission recommend approval of the ordinance as presented I'll second is that good Steve Yes. This is going for? Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, then we'll take uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. And the motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Mr. Chair. Um, the next item on our agenda this evening is a review of amended uh, TIF number seven. And our presenter is Mr. Slania. Chris, welcome back to the podium. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. <laughs> Commissioners, um, this is uh, uh, for better or worse not going to be as exciting as that last presentation uh, I'll try to keep it brief we couldn't handle two of them in one night <laughs> um, what we're looking at is an amendment to uh, Tift District 7 and that is a tax increment financing district uh, the city established in 2012 and that was to help um, with soil remediation work um, and to capture increment uh, the parcels you see highlighted in blue uh, many of them have come in or will be coming through the planning commission process for uh, 
uh, soil correction and mining interim use permits. Uh, these parcels are uh, not, not able to support development right now because of the peat and the poor soils underground. Um, they are Many of them are outdoor storage right now, and we're looking for higher and better uses once that soil is corrected. Uh, so the city is looking to uh, capture the increment once we see permanent buildings, whether that's uh, five years or 25 years, office buildings, office warehouse buildings, um, uh, job creators. Uh, and the intent here is to um, really spur development in this area. Now it's since 2012 and the Planning Commission and Council saw this in 2012, uh, we've discovered this is a parcel that also has very poor soils. This is a vacant parcel. Uh, well, Life Touch was here uh, just north of uh, the Life Touch facility. Uh, this is Cliff Road, uh, the railroad tracks. Um, this is Yellow Freight, and this is the location of the uh, uh, new city pond that we were just talking about for regional stormwater. Uh, this is owned by United Properties. Uh, they have plans to develop it, uh, but they're, they're not moving ahead right now. This is the opportunity before any construction happens, which is a, a requirement of the dis TIF district, uh, to add this parcel in there. Um, it, Increment cannot be captured after development has occurred or construction has begun or any of those things. So this is uh, a step that goes uh, from the Planning Commission. Uh, I believe the City Council and the EDA uh, as the uh, uh, development authority for Burnsville all have to act on this. Um, what we're looking to do is just uh, confirm, have the Planning Commission make a statement that this is uh, consistent, consistently zoned in the comprehensive plan as industrial. It is zoned as with uh, the neighboring parcels uh, that we've indicated here. And uh, this will move on to the appropriate uh, bodies. There was a, I believe, a 20-page uh, uh, plan prepared by our uh, um, uh, consultants Kennedy and Graven uh, for the details to the tax increment. Uh, I apologize, I have not gone through it with fine tooth comb, but I know it has been reviewed. We're comfortable with it. Uh, again, we're not s starting from scratch here, we're just adding a parcel um, to the list that was not previously on there. Uh, commissioners, it does not require a public hearing but I do need a formal motion to uh, advance this to the uh, city council. Chris, I have just a, a quick question. Um, you, know, you noted that there, uh, there'd be no change to the budget. So is that based on this particular property, if I understand TIF correctly, <clears throat> the budget wouldn't change because the, the, the increment that this property will add will simply be put towards fixing these soils. Correct. Well, really two reasons. It is One, a, it's probably the largest property we have down there at this point, if you look at everything else. It's correct. There. Correct. Uh, really two reasons. One is um, the budget isn't changing, again, because we can't capture anything until development occurs. So we don't have, we don't have a time frame from the property owner as to when development will occur. Um, and secondly, um, once that does occur, then there is a, a certain number of years what, where it will get captured um, uh, to compensate either the property owner or, or whoever for the work before it rolls back into the uh, city budget. Okay. So, and do we still have soils on site to help remediate this? I mean, on in the MRQ? Uh, we do not have... Um, at this point, we do not have any uh, public soils. That from is to say, from 5 and 13 or, and 13 or uh, county or MnDOT soils or anything like right now. Any work that's being done now is uh, private partnerships okay. for soil. Okay. I know that uh, it's still available, 
and costs are reasonable, but it, it is not from any of the public projects. Okay. Commissioners? Commissioner Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just just a question. That parcel does not seem to have uh, improved access? Correct. Correct. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. This is, um, it is anticipated um, there would be possibly an access here, assuming, assuming a office warehouse situation, we're envisioning the docks in the back, uh, an access point here, and you may or may not know this is actually a temporary access. Uh, we've agreed to continue with this property owner until, um, well, it's not County Road 5 extension, but whatever it's called, um, as we move north. Uh, it's likely the same agreement, uh, a right-of-way, uh, temporary right-of-way agreement uh, could be done and provide access on this side too. But um, that is all temporary in nature until Town Road 5 would, would move ahead or those um, projects would occur. We extend cliff and take yeah. five more. Okay. Commissioners, any other comments? Yes. Commissioner Question. Banky. Um, you said it was zoned properly. Is this zoned and guided by MRQ? Yes. So it all matches what? Yep. It all matches the the rest of the the pocket that you see right here. That was it. Okay, Commissioner Corey, I would stand for a motion. All right. <laughs> um, the Planning Commission uh, finds that the additional parcel is consistent with the comprehensive plan and asks that it would be amended or added to the new as a new TIF 7 parcel perfect all in favor say aye, aye. second pardon me second, second. Se Commissioner Benke second super super all in favor say aye. aye aye and opposed say nay and the motion carries we were an undivided house today Chris <laughs> thank you okay and that brings us to uh, any updates. Sorry, I don't have any updates. What about you guys? None. None? I would uh, send that we, uh, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved, moved by, moved by Commissioner Thomas, second by Commissioner Benke. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay, and the motion carries. Thank you very much and have a good evening.